I think we're recording now and we're on live stream already. So for everybody here and also for anybody listening on the live stream, uh, we're going to start by meditating, closing our eyes and just settling into the body, settling into our own little private cave. So it's always quite exciting to uh, set up the Zoom call and to see each other and, you know, get a kind of relationship going with the screen. <laughs> um, it can also be a bit agitating, but um, trying to take the sort of good feeling that we have between us, that sense of spiritual companionship um, into, the, into the meditation as you close your eyes, letting go of the images, letting go of the sense impressions, and just keeping that sense of connection with our good spiritual friends from all over the globe. And as you do close your eyes, you'll start to come in contact with your inner world. The world of sensations, physical feelings. And just taking a moment to notice how you've positioned your body. Sometimes we get ourselves into positions almost unconsciously or maybe through the force of habit. So just take time to check whether you're really sitting in a way that's comfortable for your body right now. I often find my heels are a little bit close to the ankles, so I just give them a little bit of space. Make sure there's not too much pressure on the knees. You may choose to slip, sit upright or even leaning back slightly. That's perfectly fine too. And see if you can just smile into the body. With an attitude of warmth, friendship, care. As though you're welcoming a friend that you haven't seen for a while. And allowing that kind awareness to slowly scan through the body. Like a warm golden light. Or maybe honey. Just gently flowing down. through every part of the body. Encountering all kinds of sensations on the way. Noticing the energy, the vibrancy the life in your body. This body composed of the four elements Earth, fire, 
water and air. This body which is part of nature a gift of life. And if you wish, you may notice your breathing. The breath coming in, refreshing, bringing energy into the system. And the breath going out. Every breath so precious and important to life. The breath that separates life from death just by a single breath. When the breath leaves the body, you don't know whether you'll breathe in again. So see if you can listen deeply in that space between the in breath and the out breath. The out breath and the in breath. fully aware of the precious gift of life. Enjoying the simple delight of just breathing. Everything in your life pared down to just this breath. No need to grasp or hold on to the breath. Each breath simply arises and passes of its own accord. You're being breathed by the universe, being breathed by life. Without needing to make any effort at all.
So if you'd like to continue to practice with the awareness of breathing, just one breath. One breath at a time, please do so. For those who would wish, I will invite you now in a guided meditation on the contemplation of dying. If at any time during this meditation you feel ill at ease, you don't feel comfortable, please just discontinue and come back to the body, back to the breath. But if it feels good for you, then you're very welcome to just follow with these suggestions for a guided meditation on dying. Continuing to allow the breath to gently flow in and out. We're going to now imagine that we're lying down on a bed, waiting to die. It's a very comfortable bed, very simple. You're lying on your back feeling peaceful and relaxed. Knowing that you've lived the best life you could. And understanding that you're nearing the end of this life now. With each out breath, you just gently let go. Not knowing whether the next breath will come in or not. And as you lie here, being breathed, a feeling of deep contentment comes over you. As you realize all the projects, all the busyness, the worries, struggles, have all ended. There's nothing now for you to do between now and the final moment of this life. Now's the time to rest. And you remember that perhaps there's someone, maybe one or two people who you'd like to say goodbye to. Just see if anybody comes to mind. You might imagine this person coming to the side of your bed. Just 
smiling into your eyes. Or maybe just bring them to mind and mentally say what you need to say to this person in your life. Reassuring them that you're well, that you're fine, you're contented. And this person understands that it's time to let you go. And soon you realize that even your body will be laid down. This body that's been your vehicle in this life doesn't serve you any longer. It's become a burden and you feel relief at the idea of putting it down, recognizing that you're carried by your own goodness, by the qualities you've developed in your heart. You bring up these qualities, the essence of your life. And notice how it feels in your mind. And a sense of peace comes over you. And the physical world starts to fade away. As though you're hovering somewhere between life and death. And in this place you realize there's nothing to fear. The more you let go, the freer you are. And you trust in the journey that lies ahead. You may remember people in your life who've helped you to come to this point this place of contentment and peace. Maybe friends or teachers, community, family, and an incredible sense of gratitude overcomes you. 
as you realize death is such a beautiful thing. Everything you've learned from these people goes with you. There's no real separation at all. But now it's time to go your way on a different journey. A journey that you know is going to be taking you further on this spiritual path. Just enjoying the peace, the freedom. From this perspective of the beauty of dying, you just look back one more time on your life. You look back to this moment as it were, in the past, when you were sitting in this Zoom room, and you want to give a message to yourself to reassure you that there's nothing to fear from the vantage point of death. Knowing what you know now about how contentedly, how peacefully you can pass on. What would you say to yourself sitting here? What are the qualities that you developed to get to that point where you could pass on with such peace, with a, a feeling of release. And from this perspective of dying, filled with all that peace, what would you say to yourself now about your worries and your fears? What are the things that you didn't really need to, to worry about or spend so much time on? when everything was all right in the end. And 
And is there anything you'd like to spend more time on? Or anyone you'd like to spend more time with? What are those essential, most important and beautiful qualities that you really value and wish to use the rest of your life to cultivate? The qualities that will lead you to dying at ease and at peace. So now we are going to gently thank this process of dying. Thank this person that is us on our deathbed who could die with such contentment in our heart, with a heart full of respect towards all of this. I'd like to invite you to gently come back to your body sitting here now, sensing the peripheral shape, maybe the level of the skin, the sensations on the skin. Perhaps you come back in contact with the field of weight heaviness, lightness, earth element, hardness, softness. Or the field of temperature, heat, warmth, cold. Sensing the water element, the cohesive nature of water that keeps the body bound up. The saliva in the mouth, the blood in the veins. Moist size and the air element, the field of movement and vibration, most easily sensed as the breath. This precious breath that keeps on flowing in, bringing life, revitalizing body and mind, and which flows out, calming, settling, relaxing the body and mind, recognizing the precious gift of breathing, the gift of life. and the gift bestowed upon us by the Buddha as an anchor and guide for the mind.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. Once again, smiling inwardly into the body as though your smile reaches every cell. Expressing gratitude to this wonderful vehicle through which you can be of such benefit to others and to yourself. So I don't have my little bell and I know some of you prefer the real life gong. So I will ring the real life gong <laughs> three times to end the meditation. Boom. Boom. <laughs> Bom. How was that? <laughs> I actually had to do that live as well. My goodness. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble with Ajahn Brahm as my teacher the first time he took me down to Damaloka in Perth because I was terrified about appearing publicly and I suddenly realised on the journey that I was a nun. And I'd probably be sitting up on the stage with him. So I said, oh, Ajahn, I won't be on the stage, will I? And he says, yeah, of course you will. You're Sangha. I said, oh, no. So I just joked and I said, so I'm not allowed to pick my nose then. And he said, yeah, that's right. Don't pick your nose. So then we got up on the stage. <laughs> and you never guess what he did. He looked at the camera and he said, are we live streaming now? And he said, because this nun over here. She asked if she could pick her nose. <laughs> so that was the first thing he said. And my goodness, it was done with such love. It just made me crease. It made me really giggle. And even though I went bright red, it kind of, I don't know, it softened that sense of self that takes things so kind of seriously. And, uh, and I think it was a really good training actually on the path. <laughs> So I often told that story since, but uh, today it's a good one to remember because this is going live. So I wonder how that was for everyone. Maybe I'll ask you at the end, but um, I see some smiles. So, and you're all still alive. So <laughs> it hasn't killed you off just yet, but hopefully, yeah, change the, perspe the perception a little bit about death. So the reason I wanted to talk about this today is because reflecting on dying, if done properly, can bring a great amount of meaning to life. Simply by giving us a perspective on life and on our priorities and what's really important in our life, what really matters most. It's also a really powerful aid to meditation because the dying process is all about letting go which is exactly what the process of meditation achieves. So the Buddha said that the whole process of meditation is one of letting go. Vosagaramana paritva, labati samadhi, labati chitta ekagata, which means the one who makes letting go the object, the main focus, the main inclination of the mind, easily, um, I don't like the word attains, but easily stills the mind, easily experiences one pointedness of mind or one peakedness of mind in the states of jhana. Because the process of dying is about letting go first of the coarser things in our mind and then eventually even letting go of the body and of course finally letting go of the breath. And these are things that happen in the stages of deep meditation too. So the more training we can get in, in death reflection, the more that helps the meditation. And equally, the more we train in meditation, the more we're getting a feeling for the beautiful aspect of death. You know, how death can be something very freeing, very liberating, and not something to be feared. Death in itself can also be a very powerful moment for potentially awakening to the noble truths of suffering and the end of suffering. 
at the very least, you hear a lot in the Christian traditions about people moving towards the light. And that's been, you know, um, kind of uh, testified by many people who've had what they call near-death experiences. There's been so many different reports and books written about people who leave the body while they're in the operating theatre, perhaps after an accident. And they talk about going towards the light. And it's really interesting because this is exactly what happens in meditation when we actually start to give up the senses and the senses sort of start to be in the background. So the sight, of course, is already closed. We have our eyes closed. But then as we go deeper in the meditation, sometimes we don't hear very much anymore or the sounds feel very muffled and far away. And eventually even the sense of um, the coarse physicality starts to fade and all that's left is the mind. And then that mind can show up as a brightness or there can be brightness in the mind, even when the body's not completely disappeared. And it's really interesting how people come back afterwards after these kind of experiences into their lives. And they say that they're no longer afraid of death. Of course, this is where, you know, your views about death and dying will have some impact if you believe that you're following the light and, you know, you're a Christian, for example, then you may even see visions of Christ or, or how you perceive a God. Yeah. So you may interpret that as, as moving towards a heaven realm. But if you're a Buddhist, you probably won't interpret it that way. Uh, many Buddhists still do interpret jhana states to be some kind of unconditioned or higher consciousness that's a permanent lasting state. But anyway, without getting ahead of ourselves here, because it's a very fascinating subject, I did want to talk about the, the Buddha's own take on death. And I have a little quote here. It's from the Satcha Vibhanga Sutta, which is also found in the Diginikaya 22, a different one. And this is Ajahn Brown's translation. I know some of you will be coming to his retreat uh, next week, starting on Thursday. And so we're going to be using this particular text. It's his translation of the word of the Buddha. So here it says, and what is death? And this is the Buddha answering. In whatever type of beings, of whatever species of beings, there is a passing away, a demise, a disappearance, a death, a dying, decease, a destruction of the kandas, that's body and mind, a discarding of the body, that is called death. So that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? And of course, in Western culture, we'll do anything to avoid talking about this. <laughs> There's so many um, scientific experiments, and apparently I heard Ajahn Brahmali talking about what they're doing in Silicon Valley, attempts to prolong our life and even to try and, you know, get some kind of immortality going by freezing brains or freezing bodies, or even putting, like downloading the mind into robots, which sounds really crazy. <laughs> But um, just in general society, there's so much fear about death that it's really not a popular subject. And yet it's that very fear of dying that gives us uh, so much suffering. You know, the fear of dying is so much uh, more painful and more, um, what's the word, disempowering or unsettling than the act of dying itself. You know, the Buddha always said that suffering, it's like a, resisting reality or craving for things to be different is the main cause of suffering, right? And Ajahn Chah very nicely put it, uh, he put it very succinctly. He said, there are two kinds of suffering. There's the suffering that leads to more suffering and that's precisely resisting unpleasant experiences, pushing them away or grasping after pleasant experiences. That's the suffering that leads to more suffering. But then there's also the suffering that leads to the end of suffering. And that's when we're able to contemplate things like impermanence, things like death, and face the pain of that, the discomfort of that, but open up to it in order to understand. And he said, this is the kind of suffering that leads to freedom, that leads to peace. It's when we turn towards things that we have a chance to understand them. And then we might even realize they're not monsters at all, you know. I remember when I was first um, doing my Vipassana meditation and we used to focus a lot on the impermanence of the body and you would feel the whole body, you know, the solidity of the body just crumbling away, almost as though it was just like sandbanks kind of falling, as though the cells were just like sand falling through the hands. And I remember at one point getting a little bit um, 
disconcerted about this because I realized that everything I loved, everyone I loved was basically um, not as solid as I thought, that my own life, my own existence was not as solid and permanent as I thought. But over time, this was very, very freeing and started to affect the way that I treated people because realizing how fragile we are can bring an extra element of really caring and taking care because life is so precious. You know, human beings are so fragile physically and psychologically, and we're all in this together. So the Buddha talked a lot about different ways of contemplating death and one that I wanted to share today, which the monastics do as an essential part of daily life, is to reflect every day that I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. And I think this is very interesting for various reasons. The first one is that this shows the universal nature of death. You know, everybody is bound by birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Yeah, this is straight from the suttas. And this immediately helps us to develop compassion towards people who otherwise on the surface level seem different from us. You know, whatever gender, whatever color, whatever sexuality we have, we're all basically subject to the same laws of impermanence. We're subject to old age, sickness, and death. And this can bring about a great deal of compassion in our hearts. And the other thing I like about this is the inevitability that it points to, that death is inevitable. It's a fact of life. We can't have life without death. And if you're a Buddhist, death without life, unless you're fully enlightened, right? So it's a non-negotiable uh, non reality. And the other thing is we never know when it's going to come. And again, this brings the moment into some kind of stark relief. You know, we have this moment, we know about this moment, we're here now, we have this one breath, but we really don't know how long that's going to continue. Ajahn Brown very kindly said to me the other day on the phone, he said, don't worry about Anukampa anymore. Even if you get hit by a truck tomorrow, I think it will carry on. So I said, oh, okay, Ajahn. <laughs> but I will try to be a bit mindful tomorrow now because, you know. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? You know, we often think about death as something that's going to happen in the future. And we forget to remember that there are many causes of death. Obviously, at the moment with the COVID crisis, death is very much in people's mind. And many of us may know people who have died or who have become very sick through the COVID. And perhaps we have a lot of fear about that ourselves. But really this death and this, you know, um, constant movement towards death is always with us, whether we have the COVID crisis or not. You know, it's interesting how when something happens and affects the Western world, it's very highly publicized. Whereas there's been so many other health crises like, you know, SARS or bird flu or Ebola, malaria, famine, you know, genocides suffering from dictatorships, from poverty, all kinds of things, that death is really happening all around. And one of the beauties of living in India was seeing that very clearly in everyday life, especially if you're somewhere like Varanasi. You know, you can be walking down these really small little side streets and they're only big enough for you and maybe a cow, a small cow without horns. <laughs> and uh, there'll be people carrying like, few, uh, what do you call it? Like a stretcher with a body on their shoulders down the streets going to the I think what was it called the something gat I forget the name of that gat now but it's where they cremate the bodies and some of the bodies are considered too impure or too pure sometimes to burn and they just throw it straight into the Ganges river you know so you can be going on a little boat trip and you see like the carcass of a cow right beside the boat I haven't seen a human body in there but it's really everywhere and sometimes it seems as though there's not a lot of regard for life because it's so in your face. But actually, having lived in that culture a long time, I did, I did sense that people had a real um, connection with life after death and with a sense of purpose and meaning that went beyond this life that was bigger than themselves somehow. And I think this did definitely incline that culture, that society towards spirituality. And even today, there are so many experiments for the purification of the mind. Buddhism is not so strong as it was, of course, really nothing like as strong as it used to be. But there is still a lot of meditation happening there. 
And the other thing I really love about this reflection, I am of the nature to die, I've not gone beyond dying, is that it's suggesting that we can go beyond dying, right? That there is a possibility of ending birth and death. And of course, the Buddha taught this. In the Samaditi Sutta, which is, um, I think it's number ooh, 10, possibly, of the Majjhima Nikaya. It's in the first 10 suttas anyway, and it's really worth reading. So it's the discourse on right view. The Buddha condenses um, the dependent origination, the cycle of causality, into two main links. He says, with the arising of birth, there is the arising of aging and death. With the cessation of birth is the ceasing of aging and death. That's simple. And the way to cessation of birth and death is, guess, anyone? The Eightfold Noble Path. So this is a really beautiful message because the Eightfold Noble Path at its deeper level is to take us out of all the suffering, not only of this life, but of future lives too, of what is called dying, you know, and, and lead us towards the state of what some people translate as the deathless, Amara, yeah? And Ajahn Brown very much likes to translate that as the state of no more dying, because it actually doesn't mean a state, it really means the end of dying, the end, of samsara, of the round of birth and death. And then the next uh, little reflection we do is that all that is mine, beloved and pleasing will become otherwise, will become separated from me. And again, this is for people who are not enlightened because of course at the deeper level, nothing really belongs to us, right? We have people in our lives who are very dear, who we do believe are you know, ours, who are beloved and pleasing to us and we don't want them to change. It's an ongoing joke at Bodhinyana Monastery about Ajahn Brahm, you know, and how everyone tries to get him to eat health food. And you just can't do it. You know, Ajahn Brahm's meant to eat chips. And he's going to eat chips and fish and <laughs> with all the batter on until the day he dies. So no matter how dear he is to, to everyone, um, you're not going to change that. <laughs> and he swears by it. He says it's healthy. So who, who am I to say? <laughs> But uh, it's really interesting when we start to go deeper in the practice to realize that we don't really own anyone. We don't really own anything. And the reason we can know that is because we, don't, we can't control. We don't have any control even over our own body. The Buddha said, you know, if it was me, if it was mine, if it was a self, then the body wouldn't be subject to affliction. It wouldn't be subject to aging. It wouldn't be subject to death. We could say of it, may you be like this, maybe may you not be like this. Or may I feel feelings that are like this, which are agreeable, which are pleasant, which are uplifting. May I not feel painful, racking, um, sharp and piercing sensations. If they were ours, we could do this, but they're not ours and therefore they lead to affliction. Yeah. So the Buddha made that very clear, but it's not all bad news because the next reflection is, is a bit different. And I think this is lovely because the next reflection is that I am the owner of my karma, the heir to my karma, abide supported by my karma. Whatever karma I shall do for good or for ill, of that I shall be the heir. And for those who don't know what the word karma means, the word karma in Buddhism does not mean any sort of fatalistic um, idea that we've done something in the past that we're, you know, and that only one particular result can happen and that we have no control over that. Karma actually literally means intention in Buddhism. Yeah, so karma is the quality of intention behind the actions of our body, speech and mind. And this is the area where we do have some influence. It's true that certain things that we've done in the past, we can't change them now, you know, and we might not have yet experienced the results. For example, maybe you had an argument with somebody or, you know, you left something on a bad note and because of that, you still have this residue of regret or remorse, you know, and you don't know, you can't affect, uh, you don't know what's going to happen as a result. Maybe the friendship is impaired, maybe you can mend it for example. But the thing is, we always can act now. We always can incline our mind now in ways that are wholesome and freeing. And so this is the area that we can control. Aging, death, separation from the loved is out of our control. But when we're able to differentiate between what we can and can't control, we can learn to put our energy into the right places. 
we can learn to put our energy into the way we're relating to our lives, the way we're relating to other people, and even the way we're relating to the results of karma that's arising for us right now. Yeah. So again, we don't make double dukkha. So right now there's some uh, fear or there's some tension maybe in our body or in our mind. We can either react to that by saying, no, I don't want this. When is this going to stop? Or we can try and gently turn towards it, hand in hand with compassion, with gentleness, with care. And we can open a little bit in order to understand what's happening, in order to cultivate a wholesome relationship with fear. Yeah. And of course, when we befriend our inner fear, that fear just shrinks away. It actually says, oh, she likes me. He likes me. They like me. And the fear no longer has control. So we do have some influence about our karma. And the other thing is that it's, we are the heir of our karma. This means we carry the karmic effects with us when we die. Yeah. Now, whether you believe in life after death or not, it doesn't really matter. Because our karma, our quality of mind is affecting us every moment. And if you have done good in this life, then the moment of death will also be very peaceful. You'll be able to remember the way you lived, the way you cared, the way you did your best. Nobody's saying you were perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. And in Buddhism, it's completely okay to make mistakes. We're allowed to make mistakes. That's how we grow. But we can bring up, we can learn to bring up the goodness of our lives, the things, the qualities that we value, you know, the, the ways we have treated others, the way others have treated us, the essence of what our life has been about. So again, remembering, you know, that there is this, um, uh, we can't take anything for granted. We can't become complacent. It gives us a motivation to really put the Eightfold Path into practice as best we can right now. Yeah. And I wanted to share a couple of stories. I'm probably going to go over time on my talk now, but um, it was really important to me to share one story about a friend of mine who died um, about seven years ago now. And she made a very um, difficult and brave decision when she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. So when she was diagnosed, I think the cancer would have been quite curable. You know, it was a routine operation and, and that was her first instinct to just go and have it done. And she was swept along by the medical system, you know, who immediately started ordering a whole series of uh, invasive tests, right? And uh, started talking about um, the operation. But she was a very devoted homeopathic practitioner and she suddenly realized that this wasn't the way she wanted to go. And I think for those around her who were very close, that would have been quite difficult. And even she knew she was taking a risk. But she was a very serious Dhamma practitioner. She'd done a lot of long retreats with, in the Goenka tradition. And later um, she got interested in Ajahn Brahm's teachings. And, and she had quite a skill in meditation. But what I witnessed, because she was a very close friend, and what I witnessed was that the process of dying that she, she went through was a massive catalyst for her practice. To the extent where I felt quite elated just watching how much she was able to let go. It was so extraordinary. And there were times when she felt, you know, that she was healing and she was going through all this work to heal things from the past and relationships that hadn't worked, convinced that these things were having an effect on the cancer. And that I think at first she thought if she could heal um, these emotional uh, issues in her life, then she could be cured. But after a while, she realized that that might not be the case, but she made a decision anyway to prioritize that healing, that spiritual healing. I'm not saying that that was, you know, the decision I would take or that that's the decision anyone should take. I actually felt quite strongly that I would probably have an operation and then do that work. But she chose this. And in that process, she did face her fears. She did face her fears around dying, but also her whole life seemed to come into some kind of high resolution. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but she was just so vibrant and alive. And she was talking to me until the day before she died and even making jokes about what she was going through. 
you know, she said to me at one point that the blood was pouring out of her more quickly than they could put it back in, even though she was trying to have transfusions. And uh, she was gathering all the quotes and all the teachings she wanted to be read out at her funeral, even just a couple of days before she died, taking every opportunity to impart some wisdom to the people she was leaving behind, you know, to take some Dhamma teachings and be able to convey that and to be able to teach through her very life. And even though we were so close, I remember when, you know, she told me that she was sure she only had a few days. I didn't feel sad. I actually felt quite elated because I knew that she'd basically been able to free herself of so many burdens and that she was passing on without any regret. It was a very, very beautiful experience. And I don't think I've cried to this day about this. Not to say there's anything wrong whatsoever with grief but it was just a beautiful process to witness. And on a smaller scale, I had my own experience. Um, it was only last summer actually, where suddenly one of the moles on my arms became really um, weird. I mean, it was already very weird, very strange shape, but I'd kind of made peace with it. I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, but one day it suddenly turned, you know, different colors and suddenly started to change very quickly. And I knew at that point that it was a melanoma. And it was quite interesting to experience my reaction to this. I remember sometimes going about my day as I was waiting for news of when I could have it removed. And I was on my own and I'd be feeling fine. And then suddenly I'd just get this wave of like visceral fear that would just came up, come over me, like wash right through. And I realized that I could just ground myself and, and really allow this wave of fear to come and that it would bring a certain type of energy with it that again brought me very much into the present moment in a way that I hadn't experienced before. And the meditation changed. I was doing a lot of meta practice at the time, you know, trying to send healing energy, but also just meta as an antidote to fear and meta as a way to connect to the love that I realized was in my life. You know, I, I just really realized the beauty of my life and all the gifts in my life that sometimes I take for granted. And one of the things that surprised me was that I really cared about my project, even though a lot of the time, you know, for those who don't know, we're working to create a monastery in England and it's it's hard work. I'm actually the only fully ordained nun in the whole country, which blows my mind because, you know, I don't feel like I should be the only one. Um, <laughs> But, you know, this is the way it is. And so to forge that path and to keep that path open for other women who want to ordain, I feel a sense of responsibility. And sometimes that can weigh heavy on me. But when I contemplated the possibility of only having perhaps a few years left, if this melanoma had spread, I realized that even if I, I only had a couple of years, I would still put energy into my project because I really believe in the power of good that it can bring into the world. As well, of course, as my own meditation, which I would also prioritize more. And interestingly enough, I mean, I don't want to say that I have a wonderful life because my life has actually been quite tricky in many ways and um, certainly not without its share of struggles and, and even heartbreak, you know, from time to time. Um, but the word that came to my mind about my life was a sense of it being exquisite. And that just was such a strange word to come into my mind. But it, so, it somehow captured the essence of the life I tried to live, which is a, as aligned as possible to my higher values. And I think this is what I realized that even though my life isn't always easy or even pleasant, it is values aligned. And it's that alignment to values, that sense of meaning and purpose that matters most in the end. So this was a really incredible reflection for me. And, and you know, even today, I still bring it up from time to time. And it has this effect of um, helping me to see my priorities and help me to see which areas of life to put my energy into and which areas I can let go a little bit more. You know, the petty concerns, the trivia, any potential grudges or perhaps a conversation with somebody that didn't end well, you know, I do try to resolve that very quickly. 
or sometimes just accept that this is this is okay as long as I can you know make sure that my heart is full of loving kindness sometimes things can't be perfect but they can be good enough you know we can do our best and this is the important thing so I did want to talk a little bit more <laughs> if you can bear with this um are you all okay for another 10 minutes of talk before Q&A yeah that's great because I wanted to talk about how we can bring this contemplation of death meditation contemplation of death into our meditation yeah so so far we've talked more about the actual physical death but another really nice way of looking at it is a metaphorical way so when we come into our meditation we come onto the cushion we can actually remember that the whole inclination the whole momentum of practice is one of letting go one of giving things away of relinquishing of abandoning yeah so what do we do first we come into this moment we die in a sense in a metaphorical sense we die to the past we die to everything that we've just put down everything we've left behind even a moment ago and we die to the future, we die to our expectations of what the next moment might bring. How many times in meditation are we always leaning forward? You know? We think we're with this breath, but actually we're anticipating the next. I know that during my solitary retreat for the three months rains retreat, I was very much practicing with contentment. But sometimes I did have this subtle expectation when things started to get blissful or things started to get bright in the mind. There'd be this very subtle leaning forward with expectation of what might happen next. And Ajahn Brahm always says, never let your knowledge, never let your wisdom, your learning, um, what you've read about or what you've heard stand in the way of truth. So we die to everything we've read and we come right into this moment to the point where there's no possibility to lean forward to the next breath. And another really interesting thing was that sometimes, of course, you know, you have doubts as a monastic, just as you do as a lay person. And as I said, my life can be quite busy. So I expressed the doubt to Ajahn at one point. I said, you know, I'm not sure that with my busy life, I can really progress on the path in the way that I'd like to. When I have solitude, it's very clear that there's a momentum that builds up. But then when I'm very busy again, I just wonder if I can really attain my, you know, what I want to in this life. And he said, but that's an expectation. That's expecting that you won't. And I thought, wow, that's really wise. That's really true. We can even have, you know, self-prescribed limitations that are very presumptuous, actually. And they stop us from listening deeply to this moment. I read a lovely thing on the, the dreaded Facebook, <laughs> but it was um, a little word that's used in the, it's an indigenous um, Australian word called dadiri, dadiri, D-A-D-I-R-R-I. And it means inner deep listening and quiet still awareness, tuning into experience to deeply understand nature. And I thought that was so beautiful because obviously the Aboriginal people had such great wisdom and were so intimately connected with the land. And they had this sense of meditation quite naturally. And this, this word just proves that, this deep inner listening, quiet, still awareness. We're talking about states of samadhi here. We're talking about that awareness that is so poised in the moment you know, that it literally can die to the past and the future. Another thing that I used in my meditation from time to time during my rains retreat was just a simple question when I sat to practice. And I just say to myself, I'd look inside, look at my mind, look at the activity that may still be there as I was settling, or maybe even further into the meditation and just ask, what can I abandon? What can I give up? And this can be such a lovely question because we realize we don't need very much. And the beauty, of course, of contentment is that the more contentment, the more value we can give to the present moment, the less we need to be happy. 
So what can I abandon becomes a very beautiful question that just empties out the mind. And then also I was doing quite a lot of death contemplation, the actual formal meditation. And my meditation now is a kind of amalgamation of different practices that I've learned. But one of them is Ajahn Brahmali's. And he does a very nice death contemplation where he goes through the whole process in a similar way. And I was doing this from time to time and finding that it took me to some very peaceful, quiet states. And the nice thing there was that I could do it flat on my back, you know, so I'd put on the little guided meditation, lie down on my back in a white room, like he always says, have a white room. So I'd have my white room. <laughs> and sometimes I'd be just lying there for hours, hours would go past. And I'd feel really, you know, quite, uh, quite light and quite free. So this is all a practice for leaving the body behind, allowing it just to fade and become almost like ethereal, ephemeral. I'm never quite sure the difference in those words, but I think you can use both. It becomes almost like gauze, you know, or chiffon, very, very light. And, you know, gradually moving more and more deeply into the mind. So this is the process of dying and it's the process of meditation too. So lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about our daily life. <laughs> I sort of want to joke first because I spoke to a friend yesterday. He's a, a really serious um, meditator. Actually, that's the Goenkaji way of describing it, a serious meditator. But he's a very well-practiced person for many, many years. And he told me about um, a man in Burma, an old man from the Shan state, who actually has a wooden coffin in his house. And every day he spends some time lying in that coffin and meditating on death. <laughs> so I'm not suggesting that. That was more of a joke. <laughs> but it's actually true that some people do this kind of contemplation too. So if you wanted to, you could. I know that these days people do create their own coffins to make sure that, you know, it's quite cheap and biological, environmentally friendly before they die. But I, I, I rather suggest the bed, actually, a very nice comfy place so that you can get a good relationship with it and it's not too austere. But yeah, for daily life, I think the most important thing really about the death contemplation is, as I say, just getting a sense of what's really important, learning to prioritise, learning where we want to put our energy, where we want to put our efforts, you know, and into things we can have influence over rather than things we can't control. A lot of the problems I think that people are experiencing with the COVID um, situation now, especially in England perhaps, or maybe other places where we have like another lockdown, is this sense of being out of control, not having, you know, the same um, agency that we used to have about where we go and what we do. You know, it's not up to us if we even work from work or work from home or even work at all. And of course, not to undermine the real serious difficulties many, many people are facing in terms of their livelihood, in terms of their health and all kinds of other worries. But a lot of the frustration, I think, is in that it challenges the sense of self. You know, we can no longer do what we want when we want to or see who we need to see. And this is very, very unusual for us, especially for people raised in Western societies where we've never had these kind of restrictions before. I was reading about the plague in, I think it was the Black Plague in England, and there was a small town near where I'm from called Eam. And at those, in those days, um, people isolated themselves for a whole year to stop the spread of that plague. And they did that as an act of, um, I don't know, maybe responsibility, maybe an act of love. And maybe you can say that their livelihoods were more locally based, so it was easier to do that in those days. But I do think there was something about a culture that was a little bit less individualistic, you know? And I think it's helpful to just notice that sometimes this sense of frustration, claustrophobia, isolation, which I also experience, can be because, partly because of a challenge to the sense of self, the sense of who I am without the people that I'm used to associating with, who I am when I'm just sitting in this house and no one knows how I am. No one asks me, are you well? Do you want a cup of tea, right? And there's a sense of disorientation around that that I think can be quite interesting to work with, again, if we're very gentle with it and very kind. 
and just getting that perspective that it is not going to last forever and that for now is a good opportunity to reflect on the fact that things have always been out of control you know we never had the amount of control we we believed we had we never really owned the things we believe we owned like our body like our work our businesses all of these things are slipping through our hands they can go at any time so how well prepared really are we you know not only spiritually but practically as well and I wanted to just share a couple of things that I um, heard a, a doctor talk about on a TED talk about two of the most important questions that you can have in order to prepare yourself for dying so he said that one of them is that in the event that you're too ill to speak and to express your wishes who would you like to speak for you at that time you know at the time you're actually dying what happens if you come to the point where you're not able to convey your wishes? Who would you like to speak on your behalf? And the other question he said was, um, does that person know what my wishes would be? And can that person actually um, pass those wishes on to the healthcare provider? Because most people these days don't die in the intensive care units. They actually die in a very drawn out way you know, just old age being extended on and on, frailty, things falling apart, like we said in the beginning, decrepitude, you know, um, the teeth falling out, the bones starting to soften and perhaps break. This part of life is extended nowadays for many of us because of this, you know, the medical system's wish to keep us alive. So are we really prepared in those practical ways? And then, of course, in the spiritual way, how are we cultivating our mind on a daily basis? Do we make time to contemplate death? The Buddha said we shouldn't only do it once a day. We should actually do it with every mouthful of food. This mouthful of food could be the last. How many times have you had a plate of food and you haven't realized what you've eaten until it's all gone? And then you think, oh, no, now I have to have seconds because I, don't really, I didn't really taste the food. I was too busy occupied with so many other things. So, of course, you know, this is a very high bar and it's not that you're failing if you don't, you know, if you're not mindful of every morsel, but we can bring ourselves more easily into the present by reflecting in this way. And of course, the other way of reflecting was to be aware of each and every breath. Yeah, this breath could be my last. And in a sense, this breath, this in-breath is the first, is the first of your life starting from now. And then I think also, you know, just realizing that we have done some good karma, we are good people, we are walking on the path. And to bring that up in our daily life, this is what the Buddha called Chaganusati, reflecting on one's goodness, on one's generosity, or one's virtue, yeah, one's qualities. You can also reflect on um, not only on yourself, but on the things in life which are good that you have going for you, you know. The fact that maybe you do have enough income to pay the rent or maybe you have a mortgage or at least a dry place to stay. I mean, obviously, everybody who's sitting in this room does have that. And we're the privileged ones. You know, far more people are actually without proper shelter, without proper food. And we can bring this up, not in a way that induces guilt, not in a way that's kind of depressing or makes us feel you know, that we shouldn't have these things, but in a way that helps us to maximize the potential, the privilege of having, you know, a place to practice, the privilege of being in a position where we can do good for others, we can share some of what we have with those who are less fortunate. And there are so many different ways to do that, which each of you, I'm sure, is doing in your own particular way. And then lastly, I think just to say that, you know, the reflection on impermanence is such a powerful meditation to do. In the meditation today, we practiced a little bit with um, feeling the sensations in the body and relating it a little bit to the four elements as well. And these are ways that we can really experience this constant change that's happening in this entity that we call our body and start to see the way the mind is also changing constantly. The Buddha actually said, you know, it's better to take the mind if you, sorry, it's better if you want to take something as the self to take the body as the self, because at least the body is here. It's solid. It lasts for some time. 
He said, but the mind is changing constantly, every moment. Yeah. So everything is in a constant flux and a constant flow. So hopefully some of these reflections have been helpful and they can help you not only in your life um, every day, the way you live, the way you think, the way you treat other people, always trying to leave uh, meetings or interactions in a positive way, but also to actually prepare you for the moment of dying and to be able to harness some of the potential that letting go will bring at that time because that really will be the moment when your practice comes to the fore. And this is what I could see so beautifully with my friend. I could see, you know, decades of practice that just came together to help her right up to the time of death. And she said to me at one point, she had a little doubt. She said, right now, you know, I'm feeling dizzy. I'm feeling faint. There's no way I can keep like uh, a nimitta in mind. Like I can't focus strong enough to get into deep meditation. Does it matter, you know, what will happen if I don't have this wonderful last mind moment that I, I've prepared for? And I reminded her that it's not about just this one moment at the dying time. It's about everything you've done in your life. It's about the general direction that your life's been moving in and the accumulation of good qualities, good karma that you've been doing all your life, you know what to speak of previous lives. All of us have got many, many, many good qualities. Otherwise we wouldn't be walking on this path. So just keep inclining towards the good, towards the wholesome, towards the beneficial, and don't have any fear about death because it will simply be a continuation, another moment, you know, just like the next moment could be the one. One day it will be the one and it will be just a natural continuation from this moment. So the real question is how well are we spending our time? Okay, so I think I've talked myself off the radar. <laughs> and now it's time for some questions. So I think we're gonna continue to record this, uh, maybe just to see how that works. Um, but as I said, um, if anyone's too shy to ask the question um, with the video, <laughs> Actually, you could ask the question by turning your video off so that we only hear your voice or you can write the question in the chat box if you have a question. It doesn't have to be a question, okay? It can also be a comment or a complaint or just some feedback, anything at all that you'd like to share. So please uh, feel very free and we would suggest that you use the little button under the participants box if you click on that, you'll find a blue hand, which will be like an icon that sticks up on your screen. So we can come to you. And I'll also check in the box on the side in case you've asked anything in there. So please don't be shy because I'm setting, I'm trailblazing with how to get over nerves about live streaming today. So <laughs> don't think I was born like this. I wouldn't even speak in class. <laughs> Uh, are there any thoughts, reflections, comments? Rob has a sort of clapping hand. Did you want to ask something, Rob? We'll send you a message to unmute yourself if you do. And you'll have to click. There you go. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Oh, brave. Good for you. <laughs> I actually did the clap because I was clapping you when you were saying you were nervous. <laughs> Talking oh. that long non stop, very good, very impressive. Um, but my question is about daily routine and daily practice. And um, can you talk a bit about how important that is and the best ways of going about it given our lives and work and kids and all that? Yeah, stuff? okay, yeah. Great. Um, could I just clarify whether you mean practice in general or are you specifically referring to how you might use contemplation of dying or uh, do you mean well, just, just general? In, in general? Yeah. Okay. Like meditation and yeah. Yes. Great. OK. Well, two things that I would suggest straight away are to utilize the time just after you wake up and just before you go to bed. So two of my favorite practices at those times are the meta practices. 
And I like to wake up and just remind myself, you know, that I'm opening my eyes to a new day. As the Dalai Lama says, you know, there's, I have a new day. This is a precious gift to be alive. How can I best use it? Most of the time, I don't even ask that question. I just start to practice metta by saying a few phrases of loving kindness the ones that I've practiced in my meta practice. So you can find your own, but the classic phrases are something like, may I be happy, may I be free, may I be safe, may I be at peace, for example. And I just say these very calming, very welcoming, friendly phrases to myself first thing in the morning to welcome myself into the world, to welcome myself into the day. And sometimes also if, you know, there's something I'm going to do or something I'm anticipating, I can even send meta towards that. I can send meta towards the people I may meet or even towards the things that I have to do. You know, we can send meta to situations, to potentially stressful situations. You can sort of imagine yourself with your family and not having much time and how that might feel. And you can send meta and goodwill to that situation you know, just to establish a, a good way of relating to something that may arise. And the same thing in the evening, um, before going to bed, I often like to spread metta, sometimes to all beings or sometimes starting with myself. I think we can be very flexible and tune into what we need at any given time. You know, sometimes my mind feels already full of metta. And I mean, I wouldn't say full of metta, but, you know, sometimes metta is not particularly my choice. And I find that it's just more calm to stay with the breath. So I do that before I sleep. Of course, this could also be a time to formally sit in meditation for 10, 15, 20 minutes if you can. Um, but I would suggest if you're very busy to be careful of putting any kind of uh, should upon yourself because you're bound to feel that you'll fail and that you are failing, and that can be very demotivating. So try and fit things in which are easy to fit in. You know, simple things like washing the dishes, you can feel the warmth, the temperature of the water on your hands. You can maybe ask to be alone in the kitchen and just to do it mindfully without talking, without being distracted. Or when you are in, you know, the full sort of flow of life and you find maybe negative thoughts or irritation arising, you can just pop in a few of those phrases again of metta. Just talk to yourself in a kind way. So this can get quite creative and, and it, can be, uh, it can become a very beautiful habit of the mind. The Buddha said, you know, that what we frequently uh, ponder on becomes the inclination of our mind. So if we frequently bring up positive, wholesome, loving, kind and friendly thoughts, we're more and more likely to have those thoughts start arising naturally in our mind. And when we meet people in situations that we've been already practicing metta toward, you may find that there's a softening there and that you do move into those situations with a softer heart. So there's some uh things that you can do there's also periods like you have to walk from a to b to get to somewhere so at that time put your awareness in your feet feel the sensations in your feet feel the hardness underneath anything that just brings you back into the moment yeah so try and just put this into your daily life and um lastly i guess because there's a lot of people here and you all probably have very varied and different types of practices but Another thing that can be helpful is just to listen to a guided meditation, you know, especially if you feel your mind's a bit agitated and you're just going to be sitting there struggling with yourself, then take a bit of guidance from someone whose voice you find calming or someone who you just, you, you know, you just have um, a natural inclination towards. So that's another thing you can do. And I hope that that's been helpful. I mean, I definitely think if, if somebody is in a position to do so, having, you know, maybe two separate sessions in the day where you can set them aside just for meditation is really, really invaluable. And it actually transforms your life. Yeah. But try not to measure it too much. Don't set yourself up for failure. Okay, any other question? We are actually at nine o'clock now. So I'll take one more quick question, maybe from Rennie. I can see Rennie has a hand up. Hi, 
Hi. Just a uh, just clarification because when I learn about this uh, death con contemplation, I think it's like the stage is like, uh, if you are able to contemplate like every mouthful uh, of your food, then uh, I think Buddha says like it's not good enough. Then you have to contemplate in every single breath that you mm -hmm. do. So I think that the bar is higher when you contemplate in every single of your breath than compared sure. to every mouthful of your of your food. I don't know. But sure. But yeah, I mean, in a sense, you can say that. But if you're aware of every moment of whatever you're doing, <clears throat> you're still in the moment, aren't you? So, you know, when you're having your mouthful, you don't you, you can be aware of every moment of that mouthful. So it's just a way to bring more mindfulness into the process of eating. And again, you know, um, obviously the Buddha's talking about the highest possible um, practice, but most of us are not aware of every single breath throughout every single day. And I used to think that that was sort of something to be achieved, but now with my practice, I'm much more flexible because of course it has to enter into daily life. So if I'm eating, for me at the time that I'm eating, the act of eating is more important than the act of breathing. And there's so much to watch in every mouthful. There's all the sensations in the mouth, there's the taste of the food, there's the chewing, there's so many things you know, that you can be aware of in any moment of that. And that can really help you to digest the food very well and to increase your health. So really, I think the idea is just an example in a sense that can be applied to pretty much any activity that we do. Yeah. So and even in the meditation, there's different things that can be helpful. Obviously, when you're sitting, the breath is an easy meditation object to use. But sometimes we might just want to be aware of like the sensations in the body or or do a kind of visualization exercise as we just did. So the Buddha's not saying that unless you watch the breath, you're not doing it properly. He's not saying that. He's just pointing out that death can be as close as the very next breath. Yeah, I hope that clarifies a little bit, but it's a good point. He definitely said that each breath is like a really great practice. And of course, uh, breath meditation was the Buddha's own preferred method, which uh, led to his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. He was actually practicing breath meditation. So it is a very powerful practice, but one I think that needs to be, there should be a lot of preparation for, because a lot of people have been trying to, do breath meditation with words like concentration and with kind of the teaching of just keep pulling your breath, pulling the mind back every time it goes away, pull it back, pull it back. And this can create so much tension and so much stress in the mind simply because you haven't done the proper preparation. Yeah. So the practice is very wide and very expansive. And so much of the practice is how we cultivate our minds in daily life. And all of that cultivation that you do will strengthen and empower your meditation on the cushion, especially if when you practice, you bring it up in your mind. So I would really suggest starting the meditations by just reflecting in wholesome ways on the things that you've done in that day, of the qualities that you aspire to or that you develop in your heart and bring that up until there's some joy and some happiness and gradually, gradually come more into the present moment and gradually, gradually onto the breath, yeah. Course, yeah, in your own time, just even inviting the breath to come in rather than going out and grabbing that breath and pulling it inside. So that would be my general suggestion. And I think we're, I should stop talking because uh, I'm more or less still on time so I hope that my co-hosts will agree with that they were <laughs> asking me to be punctual so I think we've done quite well there and I just want to thank everybody for um, being here as usual I always feel like it's such a wonderful friendly group and uh, I guess it's time to invite Mel actually is it Mel's turn to say a few words at the end uh, you almost got away without being live my dear Oh, I am still live. Shall I stop being live? No, no. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, Ben and Bors, for such a wonderful contemplation this evening. I really enjoyed it. 
Um, yes, just a very gentle um, few words on the subject of dana. Um, so as you know, these talks are freely given um, by Venerable Chanda for our delight. And any um, donation that we feel that we would like to offer towards the Anukampa Bikini Monastery would be obviously gratefully received, not just to manage the day-to-day you know, sort of livelihood of, of the food and the rent and things like that, but also to go towards the, the greater project of the first Bikuni Monastery for ladies in the UK, which is quite something. Um, also, just to say that for some of us, we're here regularly. It may be helpful for, for you, and in, it's wonderful for Anukampa if people feel that they would like to make a regular monthly donation rather than um, just little bits here and there. So whichever whichever works is good. But all of those details are on the uh, Anikampa page, um, which I think uh, has been posted, but we'll find the link and post it again for you all. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mel. Thank you very much for going live. <laughs> Uh, and uh, thank you for all your lovely messages and for your support, for your ongoing support. You know, it is really wonderful that um, we have developed this sense of community, even during the COVID, and maybe especially during the COVID, there can always be benefits to any situation. So I also want to thank you for your ongoing food support. This is another way you have been helping and you can continue to help while I don't have any visitors here. So people have offered and continue to offer the weekly shop, which is really wonderful. And I'm sure that there'll be a link for that as well. So um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I want to say. And thank you for being here again. It's really, really good to see you. And I'm hoping that we'll see some of you next week at Ajahn Brahm's retreat. I'm sure we will. And Usually what we do at this point is unmute everyone so you can say goodbye. So I think we should stop the live.